good uses as well. I spoke with Neil Abala, the Associate Director of Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties at the R Street Institute on why this software is needed and when. Hear about something like facial recognition, which has a lot of promise, but also some foibles. Is a ban at the federal level a good idea? So one of the things to consider is where facial recognition technology is right now and where it might be in five or 10 years. So I don't think that a ban right now is an unreasonable measure to take. And you see cities like San Francisco, um, Oakland, Somerville considering this. I think what could be potentially harmful is a ban for perpetuity because it is possible in the future that the technology's accuracy, reliability improve, and there might be certain instances where we would be very happy that the technology exists and it's something that we can use. Why do you think as of this moment that it would be wise you know, a prudent move to get rid of it? Well, there's really three or four reasons. One is the accuracy level right now of facial recognition technology. So if you consider Amazon software, for example, which is called recognition, um, it is notoriously bad at identifying um, darker skinned faces, faces of women. Um, and so until we have technology that can reliably and accurately identify individuals, uh, we shouldn't be relying on that technology, especially when it has this racially disproportionate effect. So that would be the first factor. Second factor would be data privacy and security breaches. And this hearing that we just had today is in light of that issue. So the Customs and Border Patrol contractor um, had a basically their data was exposed to um, multiple people. There was a data breach. And we know that the federal government as um, as you know, the representative who introduced the hearing pointed out, Representative Thompson, um, has not been great at protecting people's privacy. And so if we are going to use facial recognition, we need a plan in place to protect people's data. And then the third thing I would just say is that we need to create some guardrails in place. We would need to be very clear about when facial recognition should be used and the data set um, from which we're using it. I think part of the outcry is that we've been using all these licenses that people didn't even realize their pictures were in this database and were being used. When you're coming into the country, whether as a returning citizen or someone who's visiting, we have an expectation when we go through customs that we are going to have our picture looked at, our face is going to be scanned. Is that reasonable, whereas you right. think driver's licenses or IDs are not? So it's the situation and scenario that makes it more reasonable. Like you just explained, we might have an expectation that this is happening. Um, in the same way that if you're pulled over, I think you have an expectation that your driver's license is going to be entered into some database and the law enforcement officer is going to try to figure out if it's a valid form of identification or not. What we don't expect is that that same driver's license picture or our passport photo is going into a you know, a, a very large database and being used and searched for completely unrelated matters that are not related to us at all. And that's, I think that's what's happening right now. Um, and then the other thing that we need to think about is the degree of uh, harm that would occur if we use it or don't use it, right? So one of the things that we call for, for example, is being very clear that we only use this technology if it's um, an investigation that's a serious violent offense, for example, rather than a misdemeanor or a traffic infraction. Um, and then again, just having more transparency and rules and regulations in place for when um, individuals can go into those databases and do a facial recognition search. I asked Nila about that database saying, wouldn't that require mass data collection on the front end that can be tapped into later on, if not in real time? And she said, yeah, and again, that's why we have to lock it up securely, which is a beast unto itself. And just to be clear, uh, currently, when you're talking about what the House is discussing, this would apply to federal agencies. States could still do what they want, cities, and of course, private businesses as well. Let's get to some headlines tonight. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell testified before the House Financial Services Committee today. Powell strongly hinted that the agency may cut rates for the first time in a decade. He cited the trade war and a weaker global economy. Powell also said in the hearing that he plans to serve his full term even if President Trump were to ask him to resign. The chairwoman, Maxine Waters, pressed him on that issue. That's because the president has repeatedly called out Powell and other board members for not cutting interest rates. He wants to boost the economy, apparently. 
What role does the Fed actually play in our day-to-day -day lives, in our economy, and how it works? The agency's size 